다른 질문을 좀 넘어가 자 이제 좀 구체적인 문제를 좀 물어볼게요. 최근에 코로나 사태가 발생했을 때 많은 전문가들이 탈중국화를 예상을 했습니다. 생산기지를 코로나 사태 진앙인 중국에서 자국으로 이전을 많이 시킬 것이다. 탈중국화를 예상을 했는데 최근에 데이터를 보면 은 중국의 수출이 굉장히 급격하게 늘어나고 있습니다. 이 탈중국화하고 또 다른 전혀 다른 현상이거든. 이거 어떻게 봐야 할까요? Again, I think this is a very complex story. Um, so far, the only so let's distinguish policy from business behavior. Um, the only country that seems to have made a serious effort. to reduce its trade with China, uh, with policy, has been the US, with, its, with Trump's trade war. And if you look at the statistics, and I looked at them recently, um, the US, the share of imports from China in US imports, and the share of imports from the US in China's imports have fallen a little, not dramatically, but they have fallen in the last four years. So that would suggest some decoupling as a result of the tariff war. But of course, other major countries have not pursued such a policy. So you would not have expected decoupling of any kind as a result of that. Um, my guess is that the trade war from Mr. Trump will not proceed further. In fact, Mr. Biden is likely, I think, to lower some tariffs, though that's not certain. So I think that broad brush US attempt to decouple through trade policy and rebalance trade, the trade, bilateral trade, will probably stop. And it wasn't very effective. That's one. Second, there are specific areas of the economy where imports from China have become very, very sensitive. in the West. And the most important is the tech sector and above all 5G, that, which links with Huawei, right? The US in particular clearly thinks it is facing a security risk over its technological dependence on China And it wishes to slow China's technological advance. And this is creating a tech war. You can see this on both. They're preventing imports and they're preventing exports to China of essential components. I expect that to continue. I don't expect it to get worse, but I expect it to continue. there will be a tech separation. And of course, there is already a separation in that China doesn't allow American tech companies to operate in China. So that's, if you like, a decoupling that has existed for years and we're used to it. Google, Facebook do not operate in China. Amazon don't operate in China. And I'm quite sure the Americans will never allow Alibaba and similar operations to become significant in America and in nor will the Europeans. So that's decoupling, policy decoupling. Then the final area is business behavior. And that's still the most important, the market. China remains, as you said, a very, very competitive producer in many areas. And it's upgrading all the time. So people will go on buying Chinese products. 
Companies will buy them. People will buy them. There's no doubt Chinese exports will continue to rise. But I think quite a few businesses have decided they need to diversify their risks. So they are diversifying suppliers. Um, uh, they are bringing some supply chains back home. There's very clear evidence that the disintegration of supply chains across borders that was a dominant feature of trade up to the financial crisis has slowed since then. And I think we will see that after COVID-19, it has slowed somewhat further. So there will be less a disintegration of supply chains across borders, at least between the West and China. Within Asia, however, it is unavoidable. China is the biggest power, the biggest trading power, uh, the biggest market. It is inevitable that the countries in Asia will, like Korea, like Japan, it seems to me, will trade enormously with China because they have no alternative. They have no alternative. And the uh, unless China prevents it for some reason, um, there are risks associated with becoming so dependent on China. It's obvious. Look what's happening with Australia now. But I think it's inescapable that that will happen. But the Western view, the American and European view, has become more cautious about integration with China. And I think that will remain. 우리 한국에도 의미심장한 음. 말을 했는데 사실은 그 탈중국화가 일부 시 일부 국가 선진국에서는 일어날 수 있지만 네. 그러니까 중국의 경제가 지금 현재 에, 코로나 상황 직후에 음. 이제 에, 굉장히 빠르게 회복하고 있거든요. 생각보다 빨리. 그렇다면 음. 아시아 지역에서 한국을 포함한 아시아 지역의 의존도는 중국 경제에 대한 의존도가 높아질 수 있을 거라는 게 이제 울, 마틴 울프의 생각입니다. 음. 원래도 높았지만. 네, 그렇죠. 음. 마틴 울프도 영국인이라 중국의 영향력이 좀 작아졌으면 좋긴 했는가 봐요. 굉장히 함수 <웃음> 깊이는 제가 만나본 서방 전문가들 함수 깊이 중국에 대한 어. 어떤 불편한 기분 그런 건늘 갖고 있는 것 같아요. 그렇긴 한데 예. 그럼 제가 한 가지만 더 이어서 질문을 좀 드려볼게요. 우리 입장에서 보면 중국과 서구 사회가 서로 대립을 하는 게 그들이 그리고 그 양쪽의 무역이 감소하는 게 상당히 우리에게는 불리한 현상입니다. 왜냐하면 우리는 어, 중국의 중국의 소재와 부품을 공급해서 중국이 그걸 조립해서 서구 사회에 수출하는 수출 구조의 한 팀원이 되어 있어서 그 서플라이 체인이 망가지기 시작하면 우리에게도 상당히 불리한 상황이 될 텐데 그냥 그걸 그렇게 받아들여야 된다는 뜻입니까? 아니면 좀 다른 변수가 있을까요? I think that um, the um, countries in Asia um, that would historically have been seen as allies, have been allies of the US, obviously like Korea or J Japan in different ways, um, Australia, New Zealand, obviously, um, and the countries that simply wish to remain independent preserve their independence, like Vietnam, um, or indeed ASEAN, have some very complex and difficult choices to make. Um, the, what they would like to do, it seems to me, is to preserve an excellent economic relationship with China, because China's economy offers such huge opportunities in many ways, as you indicate. Opportunities as a market, opportunities as a source of supply uh, to make your countries more competitive. But they will also want to have a good relationship with the West, particularly the US, in order to balance China's power 
to some degree. So they will want to have both. That seems natural. The question is, will they be forced to choose? Will China say, well, if you don't, um, if you try to be too close to America, we are going to reduce our trade with you. We're going to punish you. And the U.S. will say, well, if you're too close to China, we won't support you anymore. And then countries might find, instead of being able to ha have both, they have to choose. Um, and these choices could be very complicated. So if you look at the situation in Australia at the moment, um, the Australians have indicated strong disagreement with some Chinese policies and the Chinese are punishing them, right? That's clear. So this suggests there are things that China won't accept, which is not surprising. It's predictable. Um, I don't know how countries are going to navigate this set of dilemmas. But it is absolutely clear, this is my last point, for most Asian countries, China is their most important trading partner. Not all, but for most. And if it isn't now, it will become it. So it's very difficult to get into a conflict with your most important trading partner. And it's very difficult to operate successfully without good relations with your biggest market. So I think the Asian, the neighbors of China, broadly defined, are going to face some very, very serious dilemmas, which will also, of course, become dilemmas for the US. What does it do in this situation? It cannot provide these countries with a dominant market anymore. It's not big enough anymore to do that. And it's a long way away. So I think all you can say is there are these profound dilemmas and we don't know how it will play out. But my guess as a prediction is that China's dominance in the region is bound to increase. It just, I just don't see how that can be stopped unless the Chinese economy stops being so successful. And as you've said, China has done remarkably in COVID-19. It's growing again, even this year when everybody else is shrinking. Even South Korea's economy, Korea's economy has shrunk a little. So it's very difficult to avoid the gravitational pull of this gigantic and successful country. 여기서 의미심장한 마티놀프의 의미심장한 시각이 나타납니다. 음. 사실 마티놀프는 중국 자체가 서방 시장에 의존하지 않고도 자체 성장할 수 있다는 것을 가정하고 얘기를 합니다. 마지막 부분에 답변의 마지막 부분 듣다로 보면은 그래서 중국 경제가 아 나름대로 꾸준히 성장할 때 탄탄하게 성장할 때 네. 한국이나 기타 아시아 국가 뭔가 한국 시장에서 사들여가는 중간재와 부품 음. 그런 것그 수요는 계속 늘어날 가능성이 있다. 음. 물론 서방과 중국이 서로 아웅다웅하면서 그 과정에서 받는 영향도 있겠지만 중국 네. 자체의 경제가 성장하면서 음. 중국 시장 자체가 크기 때문에 그 한국으로부터 수입은 그렇게 줄지 않을 건 늘어날 가능성도 있다. 삼프로 TV 시청자들에게 아주 흥미진진한 그다음 관심 끌만한 얘기를 좀 <웃음> 여쭤보게 물어보겠습니다. 예. 사실 그 마틴 어, 그동안 상당한 그 수입이 있어서 개인적인 포트폴리오도 어느 정도 될 거라고 예상을 하는데 요즘 어, 코로나 이후에 개인적인 포트폴리오, 개인적인 자산을 어떻게 운용할 계획인가요? Well, I'm not going to answer that question quite in the way you've asked. Since I'm very, very clear, I'm not an investment advisor. 
and it would be unprofessional of me to give advice where I'm not competent. It would be, you know, like asking somebody on a bus. Uh, the man in in England we say the man on the Clapham omnibus, and maybe uh, it would be the man on the Korean train next to you, and you say, well, what should I invest in? That's not a good basis for advice. But I have some things to say on this, uh, which might be helpful. So is this a bubble? And my answer to that, again, is I think it's not obvious. It's quite a complicated question. But it depends on something which is pretty clear, in my view. If real interest rates, at the moment, the real interest rate on long-term government borrowing of highly rated governments is negative, negative real interest rates. Um, in the US, UK, Germany, Japan, real interest rates are somewhere to between zero and minus two. Depends on the analysis, which is extraordinary. And comes back to our earlier discussion of the strange situation macroeconomically. If that is the right enduring long-term real interest rate, it will remain like this. Then I don't think stocks are overpriced because the standard analysis is you take the real interest rate on long-term safe assets, what we think of as safe assets, and you add an equity risk premium, which has usually been four percentage points, something like that. And then you look at current stock prices on a cyclically adjusted basis in terms of price earnings ratio or the earnings over price ratio, which is a simple way of looking at long-term returns. I won't go into all the details of that. Then you get, end up with a real return on stocks of about four to five percent, something like that. And that equity risk premium is perfectly reasonable. So as long as long-term real interest rates remain in this level, stocks are perfectly reasonable, reasonably priced. And they look so expensive because real interest rates are so incredibly low. So the real question is, will they remain so low? And that gets back to the questions we were discussing earlier about the causes of this long-term tendency which Larry Summers has famously written about, which used to be called the savings glut. I wrote about that 15 years ago. Ben Bernanke called it that. Or secular stagnation. These are the conditions which generate very low long-term real interest rates. Will they change or not? If they don't change, stock prices are fine. If they do change, stock prices are quite likely to adjust but it will depend a little on how they change. If the real interest rate rises because savings fall, but investment doesn't rise, that's very bad for stocks. If on the other hand, the real interest rate rises because growth improves and the future profits improve, then it's not so bad for stocks. So it, the main point I'm making overall is this is quite a complicated question. And it is not clear to me that these stocks are hopelessly overvalued. Far from it. Now, in terms of my own portfolios, you know, these are my views of investment. I'm fairly risk averse. Uh, the cost of holding money isn't very high. So I have about probably half my assets in stocks. And the rest, I'm waiting 
for some corrections, which will allow, I will believe there will be some corrections, allow me to buy more stocks. And my general, I'm not a stock picker. Um, so I don't, I don't think in my job I'm allowed to be, and I don't think I would be very good at it because it's something you have to do as a professional. So I tend to hold uh, stocks in uh, uh, broad indices worldwide, and they would certainly include uh, preeminent Korean companies because some of the world's preeminent companies are um, Korean. And I have uh, a belief in the future of um, the Korean economy. Um, and I would hold stocks in countries that I regard as safe, uh, with uh, safe governments, um, and where I think there are decent accounts and you can understand what you're buying. Uh, so to be honest, I think Chinese stocks are very, make me quite nervous. Um, but that's basically my answer. Uh, if you have a long-term horizon, you don't need the money tomorrow as it were, I don't have such a long-term horizon because I'm not very young, then I don't regard stocks now as unreasonably overpriced. And the final point on that is remember in the US market, which has been the most buoyant big market, the overwhelming dominant stocks in this surge have been the tech stocks, the big tech stocks. The big tech stocks have fantastic businesses. They are worldwide, they are fantastically competitive, they have enormous resources, they have no debt, and they have been hugely helped by COVID-19. I don't see, I can't see anything that is going to kill off Google or Facebook, a bit more questionable, or Apple or Microsoft uh, and such businesses. So I don't regard them as incredibly risky and the and the valuation of the stock market brought about by their success doesn't seem to me fantastically risky. But I could be wrong. This is not my profession. But I think the key point I'm making is it depends on what you think is going to happen to global macroeconomic conditions and therefore real interest rates and what will change them. 사실 그 네. 어, 음. 마틴 울프는 거시경제학자에 가깝습니다. 그러니까 언론인이지만 은 음. 거시경제학자에 막, 어, 가깝기 때문에 구체적으로 자산을 어떻게 어느 부분에 투자하고 하는 투자 전략가나 애널리스트의 질문은 어울리지 않는 그잘 모르겠다고 하면서도 할면서도 이제 할 얘기 다 했어요. 할 얘기 다 했어요. <웃음> <웃음> 어, 그래서 흥미로운 것은 음, 어, 울프 얘기 중에서 제한테 가장 의미심장하게 들렸던 대목은 음. 지금 현재 어 미국이나 주요 시장의 주가 상승이 네. 거품이 아니다라고 보는 거예요. 금리가 너무 낮으니까. 그렇죠. 음. 금리가 낮고 그 다음에 이 페이스북이라든지 이른바 그 아마존, 빅텍이라고 빅텍 종목들이 가지고 있는 그 엄청난 수익력, 잠재력, 아, 예, 자예, 수익 잠재력, 음. 현재 수익 돈을 벌고 있는 것, 음. 그 수익력과 미래의 수익력에 대해서 무한한 어떤 신뢰를 보였다는 거. 음. 그런 측면에서. 어 지금은 거품이 아니다. 개인적으로 마틴 오프 인터뷰 때 중국 주식에 대해서 얘기한 적이 있습니다. 이것은 번외로 몇년 전에 얘기인데 아, 아마 지금도 전에. 그 생각이 예. 유지될 거라고 보는데 늘그 음, 서방의 전문가들이 이 아시아 지역의 기업 특히 새롭게 문을 연 신흥 국가의 기업에 투자할 때에 그 투명적 투명성이 부족한 거에 대해서 불안해해요. 음. 그다음 정치적인 앞 변수에 의해서 기업의 운명이 결정되는 것도 불안해하고요. 네. 지금 현재 그런 연장지 있지 않을까라고 저는 추정을 합니다. 음. 과거에 저하고 직접 얼굴을 마주대고 인터뷰했을 때에 말했던 마틴 울프의 말을 기반으로 추정을 한다면 그거라고 생각을 합니다. Could you send me, um, if you're writing an article, could okay. you send me a PDF? Mm -hmm. And if you're, I don't know whether you, are you showing any of this as an interview? Yeah. Are, uh, could you send me a link, please? Okay. That because we are interested and Korea is an important uh, country. And uh, you know, of course, I've visited Korea many times. Uh, 
uh, the first time I visited Korea was 1972 when I was worked for the World Bank for six weeks. And it was a very, very, very important visit for me because it was the first time in my life that I visited a country that really was a developing country. And you could see that it was developing. And so it has been. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. 예, 예, 저희가 준비한 첫 번째 예, 물 건너 인터뷰는 여기서 어, 마무리하겠습니다. 아 정말 생각보다 준비한 것도 내용이지? 있고 쉽지는 않은데 그래도 예. 어, 공 드린 만큼 또 다양한 내용들이 좀 나오기도 하고 예. 예상했던 답변이라도 아 그도 이렇게 생각하는구나 아, 그렇죠. 아, 라는 것도 꽤 도움이 되네요. 그 다음에 음. 권위의 효과 음, 그건 좀 인간한... 주의해야 되겠습니다. 아, 예. 아. 어, 권위의 효과가 있습니다. 음. 예. 자 앞으로도 어, 저희가 잘 섭외되는 대로 뭔가 이렇게 주기적으로 하겠습니다라고 하면 또잘 안되기도 하고 그, 그런 면이 있어서요. 섭외되는 대로 부지런히 이 연결해서 여러분께 또 해외에서 넘어오는 인사이트들 잘 정리해 드리겠습니다. 음, 저희는 이게 애국하는 길이라고 생각합니다. <웃음> <웃음> 자 오늘 수고 많이 해주신 중앙일보의 강남규 팀장님 고맙습니다. 감사합니다. 즐거웠습니다.